will almost always record them unless I forget my computer, in which case I'll tell you. And in that case, if somebody wants to record on a phone or whatever, feel free to. But no, I'm recording right now. All right, so the immune system and immune suppressants, we're going to talk about a number of different things and then finish this set of lectures with transplant medicine and talk about how we treat focusing on solid organ transplant medicine. Okay, so the immune system has a lot of different things going on in it, and we can manipulate it pharmacologically in a variety of different ways. So we'll talk about a couple of these things. We're going to start by talking about corticosteroids, because that's sort of a, one, it's a mainstay of immunosuppressive therapy, but it also manipulates your immune system in a lot of different ways. And there's um, very few diseases out there where steroids don't have some impact on them. Either they cause side effects of them or they're used for treatment pathways. So I mean, we can come back to this in a little bit. This is a nice diagram of all the different receptors on a T cell and how everything works together as far as signaling pathways. And when I talk about like interleukins or um, uh, different CD type receptors, that's where this comes out, mTOR, calcineurin, all that type of stuff. That's where this comes back into it. And this diagram does a little bit further and actually points out drugs. So like cyclosporin and tacrolimus or calcineurin inhibitors used for solid organ um, anti-rejection medications. These are thiopurines, the same type of drug, just different mechanism. So when we talk about combining them, if you look back at this drawing, you can think about, okay, well, cyclosporin and tac are in the same class. We only always use one of them. Um, but we don't use both of them together because they do basically the same thing. There's no synergy there. So we combine cyclosporin or tacrolimus with something like either, I don't know, cerolimus or um, some other drugs that aren't really, or uh, mycophenolate, which is on here differently. So anyway, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But first, let's talk about the immune system basics. So first line of defense, you have it at birth. The, is the innate immune system you have at birth is not learned or adapted. Um, you protect the host from initial adaptive immune system before the adaptive immune system has a chance to kick in. So your body has to build up immunity to various exposures, right? And that's really what we're talking about. So yeah, yeah, you guys know all this stuff. Uh, some physiology professor probably talked about this way more in depth in your career than I will ever talk about it. But basically what we're looking at is a couple different things we can target. So T cells and B cells are usually the major uh, targets of pharmacologic activity when we want to suppress the immune system. So that's where we'll be focusing a lot of our our, um, our discussion today. Uh, this just talks about adaptive immune system and how B cells and T cells work. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in, on it. I'm not going to test you on it at all. So it's more or less a little bit of pathophys review. So uh, what happens when your immune system goes wrong? So normally your immune system does some nice things. It neutralizes toxins and activates viruses, destroys transformed cells, and then it's pathogens, which is all great. Um, hypersensitivity can happen. Um, so we talk about allergic reactions causing extensive tissue damage, hemodynamic instability to the point where you have uh, a shock type situation. You can have respiratory obstruction uh, due to swelling and inflammation. Uh, autoimmunity, so autoimmune diseases where your body is attacking its own tissues for whatever reason. So things like diabetes type 1, Crohn's disease, uh, we'll talk about a number of those, mostly in the spring. Um, immunodeficiency is just impaired reactivity, and usually that's because we're manipulating the immune system somehow. Either we gave chemotherapy and we wiped out all your neutrophils or whatever it might be, or we um, are manipulating it on purpose to prevent your body from attacking a recently transplanted organ. So that's generally something we've caused people. There are some, some diseases that cause a natural immunodeficiency, but usually this is a, a cause of something else. So we talk about hypersensitivity. You have a few different types, and I think only a couple are relevant in my course from my perspective. Um, obviously, they could be more relevant to other areas of medicine. Uh, but type 1 is the big one for me. This is your anaphylaxis, or people who break out in really severe hives. That's probably a type 1 hypersensitivity. And the, the giveaway is it's fast. It usually happens minutes after exposure. It's IgE-mediated, and you get mast cell and basophil degradation, and lots of histamine, leukotriene, cytokines, and prostaglandins, all those generally result in inflammation, which is what causes airway obstruction, and that gets to be the fatal component of an anaphylactic reaction. So the ideal way we treat people, we'll talk about the treatments as we go on here, and not really in this lecture, actually, more in the next lecture. But anyway, when we treat people, we want to protect their airway. That's ultimately the goal. Get them drugs, hopefully reduce the swelling. If not, you might have to intubate them. Um, type 2 IgM, IgG complexes of foreign bodies. This is more common with blood transfusion reactions. It may predispose people to anaphylactic reactions. So somebody could have a type 2 existing and then have a type 1 because of it. But again, I'm not super worried about that one. 
Um, type 3 is the one that is maybe more relevant to pharmacology just because drug rashes are usually associated as type 3 hypersensitivity reactions. And they take a few days to happen. So that's a big way you can differentiate somebody who's saying, oh, I broke out in highs. Well, how, when did your highs go? I was like five days into my course of cephalexin. Eh, probably not highs, probably not a type 1. It's probably more of a type 3 hypersensitivity. And the reason is, is you don't want to put that they had an anaphylactic reaction on somebody's chart when they actually did, because that could really rule out a lot of drugs that might be really beneficial to that person later in the course of their care, depending on what's going on. So I just make sure that you think, and granted, I don't really, I don't enter allergies into charts really. You guys don't use them, usually nursing functionality. Um, so I'm not really preaching to anyone who it matters to. <laughs> but if you do end up in a chart and you're entering allergies, just a little bit of thinking before you do it. I mean, just make sure you're documenting it correctly. So the, one of the things that I get all the time is, oh, this person has not, an allergy to penicillin. What drug would you recommend? And I go and look at it, and it's, na it's nausea or vomiting, or it's like a, a rash. And it's just, we can't verify it really, or it's unknown. That just doesn't really help anyone. So anyway, make sure if you're adding an actual hypersensitivity or some sort of allergic reaction or intolerance, you actually document it correctly there. That's okay. All right, autoimmunity, fail to, failure to distinguish soft tissues of foreign. So again, we'll talk about some of these as we go on. We're not really going to talk about lupus all that much. Lupus is kind of an odd bucket of diseases that I'll say. I mean, lupus is one disease by itself. But lupus can present really mild to basically asymptomatic, and then it can have all sorts of different complications. So you can have renal complications. You can have um, skin-related complications. It can really affect and cause rheumatoid arthritis-like symptoms, too. Um, it just depends on how you would treat it, depending on what uh, types of symptoms you're seeing. Type 1 diabetes we'll talk about a lot next spring. We'll talk about rheumatoid arthritis next spring, Crohn's next spring. Myasthenia gravis and MS, we don't talk about a ton. I've got a quick slide on MS here in a second, but it's, it's I'll, I'll get to that in a second. All right, uh, immunodeficiency, inadequate function of the immune system, so genetic diseases, HIV, AIDS, that type of stuff. All right. Um, some interesting stuff that I'll just point out because I really don't, there's no, place to slot this in later in the course. So I figured, why not talk about it here? Plasmapheresis is removing plasma and antibodies to replace with non-antigenic plasma. So it's an interesting immunotherapy where you're physically just removing the antibodies, and hopefully by several courses of plasmapheresis, you can rid that person of antibodies. So you might see some odd autoimmune diseases or immune-related reactions that are treated with uh, plasmapheresis. So if you ever hear plasmapheresis, that's what that is. Um, IV immunoglobulin is um, IgG antibodies extracted from whole blood. So this is a pharmaceutical product that you would dispense from pharmacy and we'd prepare for you, but it's actually a blood product. So some company isolates these and spins down, buys blood in bulk, I guess, and spins it down and isolates the IgG out of it, purifies it, gives it a dose, puts it in a bag, and then you can infuse it into somebody. Um, and basically it's an immune system augmentation for those who are suppressed. It can also form complexes that cause an overall anti-inflammatory effect. Some of the benefits we don't really understand, but you might see this done like for MS cases and other advanced uh, immune diseases. You might see um, IgG done. So anyway, I don't talk about this anywhere else, and actually they're relatively common therapies, so you might see them pop up here and there. So I figured it's worth mentioning. I won't test you on either one, though. Uh, I also won't test you on MS. MS is really complicated to treat, and it's very specialized. So when we talk about specialized things like HIV or oncology, this is like really specialized rheumatology. So MS, um, there's been a lot of different research into treatments, and one thing to remember is MS drugs are super, super expensive. So like dimethyl fumarate or tecfidera is like hundreds of thousand dollars a year. So whenever we get somebody who comes into the hospital, uh, on it and some provider tries to order it, I always have to call and say, we don't supply this. We don't, we can't even get it. You have to be like specialized through a specialty pharmacy to be able to order it. And it's again, very expensive. So usually we have a patient bring in their home medication. So if the, the moral of the story is if you ever have a patient who has MS, just make sure that they can provide their own medications if they're in the hospital setting, if that ends up being what you want to go into. And if you go into some sort of MS treatment, if that's what you do as a career, then good for you. You get to learn a lot about these. Uh, but because, again, they're so specialized, I'm not going to spend any more time on them than that. Okay. Um, and then why not talk about futuristic stocks? Because people are always like, oh, immunotherapy, what's going on with that? Uh, there are some cool applications to this. And the idea is you're using the body's own immune system and tweaking it and forcing it to do things that it's not doing correctly or that could benefit the disease that it's not doing naturally. 
Uh, so for example, chimera is a uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia treatment where they harvest the patient's T cells, they send them to a lab somewhere, they genetically modify these T cells using a virus. It's starting to sound a little science fiction-y, right? This is how the zombie apocalypse happens. And then um, the chimeric antigen receptor, or CIRT, is the ability to recognize and kill a specific source of cancer. It's super expensive, so it costs like half a million dollars for one treatment. But Novartis actually, because it's a new therapy, they'll refund the, the cost if it doesn't work. So that's pretty cool. So I think we're going to see more stuff like this, which is why I mention it. So I don't know. If you end up going into oncology, that's certainly going to be the, the frontier for, I think, the future of cancer treatment, in my opinion. But I think a lot of our, if you guys have listened to the oncology lectures, you probably know that there's not great options, especially for metastatic cancer. We really don't have much to do, especially pharmacologically. I mean, surgery, radi radiologically, sure, there might be some better options there, but it's tough. So um, with that in mind, let's talk about steroids. So steroids in general are not what you might think of steroids. When we talk about steroids, we're usually in, in the medical community, we're usually talking about glucocorticoids. Uh, and so glucocorticoids manipulate immune system related functions and they also have anti-inflammatory properties. So that's the major applications to them clinically. There's a couple other aspects of uh, steroids that are useful. So mineralocorticoids have some salt and water influence and uh, they mostly work in the kidneys and on aldosterone receptors. We won't really talk about those right away. We're going to um, talk about aldo aldosterone antagonists. We talk about heart failure, but mostly mineral corticoids don't have a huge application uh, in a lot of medicine compared to glucocorticoids. And then there's sex hormones. So we'll talk about androgens and estrogens and progesterones or progestins uh, when we talk about some of the male female stuff later in the in the year. Okay. So, but this is going to focus mostly on glucocorticoids. This complicated picture with a bunch of structures on it is just simply to show you that all steroid hormones come from the same source, so they're all really closely related. So if we manipulate any part of this pathway, you can really change things later on. So like cholesterol is how our, that's our building block. And then we build um, your progestins here, and then you have aldosterone, which again is a mineralocorticoid. You have your androgens, which are synthesized from progestins. So you can see if you're manipulating some of the ways that progestins are synthesized in the body, you can manipulate the way androgens are then synthesized. And um, estrogens then are synthesized from androgens. So you can see they're all kind of connected. And no matter what we're manipulating, we're going to touch some of that some way. So instead of usually messing around with hormone synthesis, we usually like to mess around with hormone receptors. But that's all I'm going to talk about with sex hormones for now, because that's not really the point of this lecture. Let's talk about glucocorticoids, which will come up multiple times throughout the year. All right, so cortisol is the major endogenous glucocorticoid in humans, a.k.a. hydrocortisone is the pharmaceutical name of it. It's the same exact structure. One's just made by drug companies, one's made by your body. Uh, so production governed by adrenocorticopic hormone. Um, corticotropin and cosyntropin are some other names for things that work in the system too. And pathophys stuff that I'm reviewing very briefly, but I'm not going to get into details and I won't test you on that. Not my realm. Uh, more stress, higher amounts produced and what that leads to usually is increased blood glucose, enhanced glucose uptake, and it curbs some non-essential functions. So when I talk about, when we go back to diabetes and we talk about, or we talk about some of the side effects, think about diabetic patients and how they might be affected by this. That's a really common side effect. We see people who might have otherwise really well-controlled blood sugar. They take a course of glucocorticoids and their blood sugar gets all out of whack. Um, other things we might see are people who are normal um, glycemic. They don't have any history of diabetes and suddenly they're on insulin because they're on a course of corticosteroids. So that's a really common side effect. All right, so a nice little diagram to show you some of the major acute side effects of this versus chronic. So that's one of the big things to differentiate when we talk about steroids. So steroid effects and the way we use them, we use them in lots of different types of medicine. And I'm just doing an intro now. We'll talk about them as we go through. So we'll talk about them with respect to transplant. We'll talk about them um, with respect to different autoimmune diseases and things like that and pain management and other types of stuff. But for, for now, let's focus on the general picture and also short-term and long-term response because the, the, knowing the side effect profile, I think, is really important for steroids. So short-term st stress response. Again, we talked about the blood glucose increase. We also increased blood pressure, increased breathing rate, metabolic rate, and changing blood flow parameters. So you're going to see some hemodynamic changes. Usually the hemodynamic stuff isn't enough to make a big difference, but it is possible. You could, somebody already has 
underlying hypertension, you could increase that or make that more problematic. Long-term response, sodium ions in water by the kidneys, increased volume, increased blood pressure, um, can be problematic for people who have heart failure who are retaining fluids for other reasons. Um, and it converts proteins into fats to glucose. So it actually has some lipid um, distribution issues that will come up, and I'll talk about some of those uh, also. Now, the long-term stress response that we like uh, in some situations is the immune system suppression. So that's like a, a, stero or, um, a chronic steroid dose will be used for any transplant patient as a backbone for their immunosuppressive therapy. Low dose, prednisone, for example, uh, pretty much standard of care for any uh, solid organ transplant. Yes? Yeah, so you're usually looking at, I, I would say, about two weeks is the cutoff. That's debatable, but that's pretty pretty close. Um, glucocorticoids. So um, you might hear these referred to as corticosteroids as well. A lot of people just call them steroids. So you might say, oh, I'm going to prescribe them steroids if you're talking about these. Um, mostly affect cellular immunity. So usually these are working on specific steroid hormone receptors intracellularly. They um, <clears throat> can be cytotoxic to certain types of T cells, excuse me, which is why they affect the immune system and uh, reduce its ability to function. They modify cellular activity. They suppress allergic immune and inflammatory responses as well. So they prevent that T cell, B cell uh, ability to um, have uh, produce inflammatory mediators. So they're working way downstream where we have other drugs like compare it to an NSAID. So like ibuprofen or Advil is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. The reason is because it's not steroidal, but it has anti-inflammatory effects. This is a steroidal drug, of course, because that's what they are, and they have anti-inflammatory effects, too. They just work upstream by preventing inflammatory mediators from being produced at their source, versus an NSAID blocks the receptor and prevents it from actually working. So two different mechanisms, but similar effects, actually. So when you hear that NSAID term, if you've ever wondered, what does non-steroidal mean? Why is that called that? That's why. We'll talk about ibuprofen and NSAIDs when we talk about pain uh, in a while, but uh, just as a little hint there. Um, and this is what this diagram shows as well. So you have corticosteroids that are working way downstream in this whole, this is an inflammatory process chain. Basically think about it as mediators triggering other reactions. So you have different, um, whatever it might be, tissue damage, stress, whatever is going on, uh, um, releasing arachidonic acid, which then gets changed or altered by a couple of different enzymes. So cyclooxygenase enzymes will ultimately modify these into prostacyclines, binders with thromboxanes, which have inflammatory effects and platelet inhibition or platelet um, binding effects as well with thromboxane does. So anyway, NSAIDs will actually block the enzyme from making that happen. We have some drugs that work directly on different receptors in this group too. So corticosteroids just work much further upstream and prevent a lot of this from happening. So much more broad sweeping effects, which is why they have a lot of side effects. Um, so when you think about anti-inflammatory versus immunosuppressive, uh, I think in my mind sometimes it gets a little confusing just because we're talking about two pretty different things, but they also are linked together. So your immunosuppressive effects and your anti-inflammatory effects do uh, meet somewhere in the middle, but it's just... It's the same mechanism of action. They're just having different downstream effects. Again, because steroids have very broad applications and very um, a variety of different cells that they'll target. So ultimately, you get a lot of different uh, systemic effects from using them. So again, think about them as two separate things, and we use them treatment-wise separately. So we might want to use the steroids for anti-inflammatory effects, and we have no interest in suppressing the immune system. And that's where short-term courses come in handy because we don't really see immune suppression with short-term steroid courses. We don't see that happen until we give somebody weeks to months of steroids. And so that's a really nice benefit of the drug so we can avoid some of those nasty long-term side effects and still get some good immediate therapeutic benefit, like, an ex for example, like an asthma exacerbation. We'll give steroids uh, to reduce the anti-inflammatory effects or to promote <laughs> anti-inflammatory effects, I should say. All right, uh, different drugs. So these are really all the steroids you should need to know for your life. And there might be other ones that come out here or there. These are pretty much, there's not a lot in the category for how ubiquitous they are as far as medicine and their use goes. But the top ones are shorter acting, as you can see in this chart. And what you're looking at here are a couple different 
categories. And what I'd like to point out is the mineral to glucose potency. So hydrocortisone is a one-to-one, -one, meaning it mimics your systemic cortisone or cortisol, which is going to have equal amounts of potency on mineral-related effects and receptors and glucose-related effects and receptors. Now, if we want to manipulate that all the way to the mineral form, we have fludrocortisone, which is a pure mineral corticoid. I mean, it does have some gluco activity, but it's negligible compared to its mineral activity. So we're talking about messing with um, fluid retention, sodium balance, those types of things. That's where fludrocortisone might come into play. Not used a ton clinically, but it is an option. And then we have our other group of drugs, which are pretty much all the opposite of that. So they're all going to be more heavy on gluco. So if you're thinking about remembering these, you really have two drugs that are in separate classes. You have hydrocortisone, which is a one-to-one, -one, fludrocortisone, which is heavy on the mineral component, and then everything else falls into gluco. So yeah, methylpred and prednisolone have some effects on mineral, but again, it's pretty negligible, and we don't care about it clinically. It's not going to have the effects that we're looking for. We're really using all these drugs for their gluco potency and their anti-inflammatory or immune suppressive effects. Uh, the one drug that's not on here is prednisone. Um, prednisone you can put into the same category as prednisolone. It's just a, it's a slightly different modified, but prednisone is going to be the most common oral um, corticosteroid you're going to see. The ones that are really potent, dexamethasone and betamethasone, I'm not going to te test you on parenteral corticosteroids at all for this exam. I just want you to know the basics of what corticosteroids are. We'll talk about different um, steroid preparations in detail during the derm lecture, but uh, for now just kind of think about them orally or IV, and all these drugs are, are basically the same. The thing is is that you can get really potent effects by giving somebody methylprednisolone, you just have to get a lot more of it than you would dexamethasone. So they do basically the same thing, it's just you can get by with less and get more effects. So this again comes goes back to the whole concept of potency, but they are more potent. Okay, so hydrocortisone, we don't have a lot of roles for uh, adult medicine, just due to more potent options. There are some unique uses of hydrocortisone, though, especially in Durham. We use hydrocortisone a bit, but again, I'm not going to talk about that more here. Um, they do use this in septic shock, so the idea is, is that sometimes when you get severe sepsis, your body can't produce enough cortisol to um, support your, your body hemodynamically. So right when you have a stress situation going on, your body wants to churn out cortisol, it helps uh, increase blood pressure, increase glucose utilization, and all those types of things. So if you're septic and all this inflammation is going on, your blood pressure is crashing, your body should be naturally shooting out tons of cortisol. Um, that might not happen, or you might be so septic and be septic for a while in the sense that your body's used up all its resources and it just can't keep up, and so you aren't having an effect. So sometimes we'll use higher cortisone for a supplement of the natural cortisol in those patients. That's usually like a really sick ICU septic patient. And it's usually done if the patient's not responding to other things. So if their blood pressure is crashing and they're, you're giving them lots of fluid, you're giving them vasopressor, so you're chemically trying to constrict their blood vessels, um, and that's not working, that's where we usually use hydrocortisone. Ultimately, that's one of the only um, major applications for it. You might see it used here and there in other areas, but that's the big one as far as um, uh, IV use goes. And then, again, topically, there's a lot of uses for hydrocortisone. You guys have probably seen hydrocortisone over the counter. It's one of the more common like anti-H medications. But anyway, from a, a systemic point of view, this is really all we're doing. But uh, that, that's all I want to talk about. It. It's not super common from a systemic point of view. Um, prednisones are go-to oral uh, glucocorticoid. Prednisolone, you can kind of consider them very similar. They're essentially one-to-one -one as far as their dose conversion goes. Um, it's slightly different, but that's, that's really all you need to know. Um, prednisolone is the active metabolite, so prednisolone gets metabolized into prednisolone. Um, if you're looking for a liquid form of it, the liquid only comes as the prednisolone. Why? I don't know. It's just the way it is. Uh, but they're essentially equivalent. Um, and again, we use this as our go-to oral for almost every condition you'd want steroids in. So steroid bursts or tapers, so like, again, we're going to talk about respiratory in a little bit, but asthma attacks, um, COPD exacerbations, that's going to be your go-to. Uh, for uh, maintenance immunosuppression for transplant patients, also going to be the go-to drug. So this is where um, I think people get a little confused and a little concerned is when to taper, and I'm not going to test you on this per se. I'm not going to like make you do a, a prednisone taper, but I would like you to know generally 
when it's okay to not taper a patient. Usually, if you're doing a burst or a short course, that's probably going to be between a week to two weeks, maybe less, maybe five days even. And you shouldn't need to taper up to two weeks. Now, some providers won't feel comfortable giving somebody two weeks of steroids and then stopping them cold turkey. Um, ultimately, it, it's been shown that that is okay to do. But certainly, if you wanted to do a small taper on the patient, you could do that. So what I'm talking about here is, like, let's say you have somebody on 40 milligrams a day, and you have them on 10 days of, of steroid. And uh, the problem is, is that if you stop steroids cold turkey after somebody's been on them a long time, your body's used to having that steroid in its system that it's getting from a different source, so you aren't endogenously producing cortisol at the rates like you normally should. So if you have a stress response or something, you're at risk for possibly getting an infection or things like that, so that the cortisol can't help your body react like it normally would. So in this case, 10 to 14 days shouldn't be really enough to suppress that, but at the same time, um, if you're on it for 28 days or three months or two years or whatever it may be, certainly you'd want to make sure you don't stop that abruptly because then you're leaving that patient basically without any endogenous corticosteroid to work with. And uh, that can, of course, cause problems. So that's the, that's the whole rationale behind why we get concerned about tapering patients. And there's nothing wrong with the taper. Again, if you put somebody on two weeks of steroids and you're like, ah, I'd be more comfortable tapering them, maybe they're on 40 milligrams a day and this is day 14, I'm going to have them do 20 milligrams a day for a week, and then 10, and then 5, and then stop, or something like that. Steroids aren't, uh, tapering is not an exact science, which is why I'm not teaching out about it specifically. It's more or less what you feel comfortable with. The longer the person's on the drug, the longer the taper is going to probably extend out. And the higher the dose, the longer it's going to take to step down. But usually like half per week, half per week, half per week. And once you get to about 5 milligrams, you can cut them off probably. Again, personal preference, you can do what you want with that, but um, 10 days of steroid, you could certainly stop uh, cold turkey without really any issues. Um, methylprednisolone is one of the more common IV uh, options we have out there. It's called Solumedrol. So you hear people use that brand name quite a bit. And it's pretty, it's got decent potency, slightly higher than prednisone. And it's fairly effective, usually because of the dose we give. So like, let's say for, for example, an asthma exacerbation, you might use 40 to 60 milligrams once daily of prednisone. Um, IV methylprednisolone, your first dose might be 125 milligrams. So you usually give pretty big doses right away. You get good effects. So a lot of times in an asthma exacerbation or like um, an anaphylactic reaction, we give a dose of 125 of solumetrol. It's a really common dose, it's a really common starting um, aggressive IV steroid to give somebody who's got some sort of immune response going on and you want to get them under wraps quickly. Works very well, works very fast, um, and it's a, it's a great drug to have in the back of your pocket as far as anything immune reaction, especially if you're going into emergency medicine or urgent care. Now on the other side of the coin, for oral methylprednisolone, not really as commonly used as standard prednisone. There's not really a good reason to ever use this over prednisone. The one thing people like to prescribe is this thing called the Medrel Dose Pack, which is kind of like a wimpy steroid taper. So it starts, these are all four milligram tablets, by the way, and it's all the same. So if you prescribe a Medrel Dose Pack, this is what you're going to give somebody every time. It's always the same drugs. And it comes with this nifty little, like, um, instructions already printed on the label, so it's really easy to follow for patients. Anyway, you take two tablets at breakfast, one after lunch, one after supper, and then two at bedtime, and then you taper down after that. So it's like a six-day taper, which again, I just told you isn't necessary. And exactly right, that's not necessary. So if you're thinking that, good for you. <laughs> if you weren't, I just told you. Um, I, I People still prescribe these a lot, I just, I really don't get it. I don't get what the point is. Just prescribe somebody 20 of prednisone once daily for six days and be done with it, or five days, I mean, it's the same thing. Um, are they really getting any benefit from this four milligram on day six? I don't know, probably not. Um, clinically, I don't think you could prove that, but no one probably cares enough to try. But I think people like this because it's low risk. So ultimately, you're giving them, what, um, 24 milligrams to start with, which is a pretty, I mean, that's not even enough for, like, an asthma exacerbation. So where people use this, I'm not entirely sure. I think they're like, well, they might benefit from steroids. So sometimes you'll see this prescribed for, like, a, um, somebody with back pain or back spasm. Sometimes they'll throw steroids in for that. Different type of pain management as an alternate. Sometimes you might see these done for headaches or migraine management as well. They'll do a, a dose pack. But again, I think the dosing is it's wimpy. I mean, I wouldn't... The 20 milligrams, great. The first day, fine. Second day, okay. 
after that, it's kind of like, why don't I just take 20 and hopefully get more benefit? That's my personal opinion. Um, but a lot of people prescribe these anyway, so do with that what you will. Yeah. A lot of the ortho and sports med docs that I read seem to like them. They like them, yeah. Or you think that back being some sort of inflammatory, generalized musculoskeletal type thing. Yep. I don't know. People seem to react pretty positively to them overall. Yeah. I mean, they would come back and be like, I was feeling good for my background. Can <laughs> yeah. I get another one? Yep. So I, usually I've seen it used as more of like, okay, they want something, I don't want to go big guns, so I'll give them the dose pack just to kind of make them feel good, yep. and then by that time we'll usually get some extra imaging or some more information, and then we can figure out better long-term plans, so it's yep. really kind of a, a band-aid approach to mm -hmm. what I've seen. Yep. Yep, exactly. And it's it's easy to prescribe it. And then you, you don't have to worry about them stopping like a high dose cold turkey, even though even if you just said, Okay, I'm just gonna have you take twenty milligrams of prednisone for six days and then stop. It's basically the same approach. There's no risk in doing that, but this is ingrained in a lot of people and again why they like tapering at uh, six days, I just I don't get that part of it. They like it, yeah. It's, it's convenient. It's kind of like a Z pack. You write Z pack on a prescription. You throw it in the pharmacy. They fill it. Everything's good. You write Medrol dose pack. Everyone knows, and the pharmacist gets it. And like, do I really have to type all this stuff out again? Yes, legally, they actually have to type all that onto a label as well. So anyway, yeah. Wow. You can't just say C directions. That's illegal. Um, you can have like a little ancillary tag that goes on there, but you have to type most of it out there too. So yeah, it's fun. I mean, you have like quick sigs and stuff like that, but still, it's annoying. <laughs> so, was there another question? I thought I saw a hand. Um, I'm just gonna say, it sounds like it's more of a like, Yeah, I mean, I think I think steroids do work, but I think that if you're gonna do it, you could just do the same dose for five days. I mean, I don't. I that's that's my whole point. I don't think there's anything wrong with doing a short course of low amount of steroids. I just don't understand the tapering over a few days. That's where pharmacologically and the risk just isn't necessary to and it's easier to give somebody prescribe somebody prednisone once daily 20 milligrams that's all they have to take it's five tablets you're done uh, and uh, if you ever if you're ever wondering about steroids steroids are usually once daily especially prednisone um, so why this is broken up is another um, debatable question you could take all this at once so you could take all ta all those tablets every time at the same day so like if somebody's if you're prescribing this to somebody at 6 p.m they're like, well, what do I do? Take it all right now. That's what you can do, and that's perfectly fine. So that's another weird thing about it, too. It actually, it, well, it tells you exactly what to do. It does slightly overcomplicate the scheme. Some people will argue, well, the side effects, like the glycemic response might be different if you're spreading it out. I don't know. It's the same amount of steroids over the same period of time. So I don't really buy it. But, again, yeah, I'm a little skeptical of this whole thing, so as you guys can tell. <laughs> but if you ever prescribe it, I won't, I won't judge you. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> we will, we will. Yeah, we will. <laughs> Just don't prescribe ZPAC for Z Z -pack for cap, and then maybe yeah, I guess. All right. Um, <laughs> Triamcinolone, uh, which comes as a number of products. This is a really popular topical steroid. So it's like um, we'll talk about the string term, but I'll say it now again. It's probably like the go-to prescription medium potency topical steroid. So if you want to remember one right now. It's a good one to know. It's it's really popular as far as like Trimsinolone cream. Start with it. If, if over the counter things aren't working, it's it's definitely the most popular choice. It's a nice medium potency steroid that doesn't really have a lot of other issues with it. I'll talk about that during, during what happens when you use high potency too long. But anyway, another popular choice is a intraarticular injection. And um, if you ever heard like a cortisone shot, usually what people are talking about is Trimsinolone. And uh, Trimsinolone causes this product called Penalog, which is like a, a suspension. It's this thick stuff, and you inject it actually into the joint, and it gives you local anti-inflammatory effects for, depends, like a few weeks, usually, like I say, maybe four to six weeks, depending. It does have diminishing returns, so where you'll see this used most commonly, I think, is like a bridge to a knee replacement. So somebody's not doing well, they need something to get them mobile, keep them mobile, but this isn't a long-term solution. You can't do this for years and years and still get results. So you might get a few shots out of it. You might get a year out of it. I don't know. It might give your patient enough time to exercise, maybe lose some weight before their um, before their uh, replacement, but uh, otherwise it's it's a bridge. It's a Band-Aid, but a longer Band-Aid than like a steroid would be. And the nice thing about intraarticular is you don't get really any systemic absorption, so your side effects are virtually non-existent with these. 
The other product that you can do intra-articular with is uh, Medrol, and it's called Depo Medrol, and it's a similar product. So be careful if you're if you're writing this into a like EMR or something like that. But if you type Medrol, you pick the right one. Uh, so Depo Medrol is the brand name that is the intra-articular one. It's like an oil based. Hopefully anybody dispensing this would know, uh, but you never know. And you definitely don't want to inject these uh, suspensions intravenously. You could probably kill somebody because it's going to cause an embolism of some sort because it's really thick, nasty stuff. So definitely um, careful. So. All right, dexamethasone, another really common steroid. It's PO and IV, one-to-one, -one, um, good bioavailability as far as dosing goes. You can substitute for prednisone or methylpred. Again, all these steroids basically do the same thing. Yes, dexamethasone is more potent, but it's used for the same indications. Um, where you see dexamethasone more studied, per se, is like with chemotherapy, nausea and vomiting. They use decadron or dexamethasone a lot for those regimens. But really, you could use any steroid. There's no reason why you have to use dexamethasone. It's just that's what was studied in a lot of the trials. Um, some of the pros with dexamethasone, you can, relatively speaking, give a larger amount of steroid using smaller volumes. So like for cerebral edema, sometimes they'll give massive doses of steroids. I don't usually see this because we're in a trauma center. But if you have like a spinal cord injury, like a traumatic spinal cord injury of some sort, usually they give massive doses of methylprednisolone. But you can also use dexamethasone. You can buy it with a little bit less volume overall with still the same potency. Again, popular for chemo-related immunosuppression and also as an anti-emetic. So it's very popular in the world of oncology. Uh, does not interfere with plasma cortisol level. So there's that. Um, I think I think I glossed over this part. I'll mention this quickly. Did I use it? Oh, no. Okay, so this cosentropin stim test thing, I didn't talk about that. Uh, what that is is it's a, you can inject somebody with uh, something called cosentropin, and that should naturally stimulate their um, adrenal gland to kick out cortisol. Uh, endogenously. So the reason why we do that is in these pictures where we have people who are maybe septic and they aren't, we're questioning whether their body is producing enough cortisol naturally, we can give them cosentropin and then we can test their cortisol levels and see how it responds. And if they respond, then we're like, well, they probably wouldn't benefit from any hydrocortisone because they're already producing enough. Um, and if they don't respond, we can say, well, maybe they would benefit from hydrocortisone. So that's the diagnostic test there. You can do that pretty quickly. Um, the thing is, is, if you already gave somebody a bunch of hydrocortisone, you're going to interfere with the test because you can't, what are you measuring? Are the, is it the hydrocortisone you injected somebody with, or is it their natural cortisol that they're producing? You don't know at that point. So that's one of the tricky parts about it. The, the reason why I put that with dexamethasone is from a, a perspective, if you want to give somebody steroids right away and didn't want that to interfere, it's a different molecule. So if you're measuring cortisol levels, you could still measure the cortisol response, theoretically, from cosentropin. Um, even if they have dexamethasone circulating because the chemicals are different structurally. Does that make sense? Kind of a, a little bit advanced, and, and don't, don't worry about that. I'm not going to um, ask you some complicated question about plasma cortisol levels and cosentropin stem tests and stuff like that. What I want you to know is that it's just a different compound, so um, it comes up differently in tests. Uh, cons, IV onset is actually, even though it's much more potent, it's not quite as fast as IV methylprednisolone. So IV methylprednisolone is still generally preferred um, for those really acute situations, it's our go-to. Okay, um, side effects. So steroids, again, have all kinds of side effects. I'm going to kind of break these down into different ones. Uh, psychiatric can be short-term or long-term. So I put that as uh, sort of all these are grouped together, more or less. But anyway, psychiatric is uh, people can experience lots of different things. Some people will actually report euphoric feelings on steroids, like they like the feeling they get when they take a steroid or get injected with steroids. Not really, I don't know if I've ever seen somebody drug seek steroids per se, but I'm sure it happened. Um, depression, agitation, emotional instability, and even psychosis are actually not totally uncommon to see gradients of those. Not that people are like outright schizophrenic, but if somebody does have a uh, underlying mental health history, it might be something that exacerbates more severely with those patients. And that can happen immediately or it can build up sort of as they take it over a long term. It can make them maybe you see depression kind of growing in the patient or getting worse, uh, whereas other patients might present and they might feel really agitated right away when they're on steroids. Uh, physical effects. So we talked about some of the lipo distribution issues. Buffalo. Okay, so these terms are like technically scientific, but they're really, I don't know, they're good. Uh, buffalo hump is <laughs> what it sounds like. So here's a picture of this poor lady who has some lipo 
distrib distribution issues with steroids. So uh, back of the neck and also rounding out the face. So um, when George talked about HIV, I think he talked about some of the older drugs that cause some of the opposite, like they make your face really gaunt. Uh, these ones actually do the, the opposite of that, where they kind of balloon it up a little bit. Um, and that's a more of a chronic side effect. You shouldn't see that short term. Thin and bruised skin, you can see with short or uh, with um, acute or chronic use. Usually it's more associated with chronic steroid use. Um, and it does somehow wear the skin down. It's more common with topical steroid preparations, especially with high potency on the site. But you can get it over time if you're using a, um, uh, a oral steroid regularly. Uh, decreased muscle and increased abdominal fat are other things too. And again, most of these physical changes will take a while. The one that's going to be fastest would be the skin effects, and that's usually due to topical. So oral effects, probably going to take a while to see any of these. Um, where you might see some risk is if you have like an older, I think of like the older, more brittle men and women who are maybe on blood thinners who already look like they're all bruised up to begin with who come in that I get a little nervous on and are they going to get worse like that? And yeah, probably steroids won't make that picture any better. But um, a short course still shouldn't be totally problematic for them. All right, um, cell growth and division, they inhibit cell division and DNA synthesis, which can delay the healing process. So if you're trying to get a wound healed or something like that, that can be counter to that. They can also stunt growth in children. So try, if children are on it. Sometimes they'll do drug holidays if they can. Um, but if you have a transplanted kid, they're probably going to be stuck with that growth stunting. I think overall you'll see growth catch up later, but they might be stunted more early than, than a normal peer would be. Um, calcium metabolism, so they decrease intestinal absorption of calcium, they increase renal excretion and excessive loss from uh, the vertebrae and ribs is seen too, so you're at higher risk for fractures really is what you're going to see with um, long-term corticosteroid use. Um, endocrine, hyperglycemia we talked about, increased appetite is also seen with steroid use. All right, um, Cushing syndrome is something that happens with hypercortisolemia, so excessive amounts of cortisol in the body. It's caused usually by either um, different types of tumors is pretty much the common thing where you get ACTH production. Um, if it's this type of specific uh, Cushing's um, etiology. Treatment, we're usually directing the primary cause, so uh, extract it, get rid of the tumor if you can, treat the underlying chemotherapy that's going on, um, or if there's other sources that you can identify. There's a couple drugs that I'm not going to test you on, don't worry about them, but they do treat Cushing's, they're kind of like, uh, they work as anti-steroid effects, sort of. Um, long term, not going to be a great option for most people, but they can happen, um, but they can help in the short term. Um, symptoms disappear after 2 to 12 months, you get uh, a number of different things, like what you'd expect for somebody who takes a lot of steroids, so that's essentially what's going on. Their body's just producing a lot. Addison's disease, opposite, primary adrenal insufficiency, uh, associated with tuberculosis and a number of autoimmune diseases. So people who have basically any autoimmune disease have a risk of having Addison's as a comorbid uh, complication. Uh, there's a lot of other infectious diseases that are associated with Addison's disease, but we don't really know why that happens. Uh, and also some cancers and some medications cause it too. Acutely, you might see fluid and electrolyte disturbances. That's mostly due to the lack of mineralocorticoid effects. And you can replace those fluids and correct electrolytes relatively easily. Um, IV glucocorticoids can help. Usually you're going to use hydrocortisone for these patients because you want to supplement the endogenous hormone as best as possible. And that's the one that matches cortisol. So that's pretty much all you need to know. If you see somebody on chronic glucocorticone, I talked about how there's not a lot of clinical applications. That's one of the clinical applications for this. It helps people retain uh, fluid and um, keep their electrolytes more in balance. For people who have Addison's, so and that's really one of the only times you'll ever see that used chronically. It's not super common. Okay, so summary. Uh, oral options. You have basically prednisone and dexamethasone. Yes, methylprednisolone comes as an oral option too. I kind of lump it under prednisone. It's very similar. Like if you talk about 20 milligrams of prednisone, it's basically 20 milligrams of methylprednisone. It's basically 20 milligrams of prednisolone. They're all kind of the same potency, more or less. Um, dexamethasone comes oral and IV. Uh, potency, uh, prednisone is slightly less potent than methylprednisone, very slightly, and dexamethasone is quite a bit more potent than methylprednisone. And then glutocortisone is mineral. You'll notice I didn't mention betamethasone at all. 
Um, betamethasone is potent, like dexamethasone. Its, its role is really limited. It's only really an IM injection, and it's topical too. And they use it in some OB applications, which we'll talk about during um, sort of the perinatal stuff. But otherwise, I don't want you to know about that right now. You can think about dexamethasone as your uh, standard high potency corticosteroid. All right. <clears throat> Other applications, we'll talk about nasal sprays during the ENT ish lecture. Uh, inhalers, we'll talk about that during respiratory. So there's a lot of applications for steroids there. And with that, let's take a quick break and we'll talk about the um, transplant meds and immune suppressive therapy. We should come back in five minutes or so. But learn what all right, switching it up, seat wise. <laughs> okay, uh, all right, let's pick it back up. Talking about transplant. So, you might think this is a highly specialized field, and you're right, but um, we actually have a lot of PAs that work on our transplant team. I mean, we're, we're a big transplant center, but we have, it's, they're a big part of how our team operates and communicates between surgeons and heart failure specialists and pharmacists and everybody else, and they do a lot of the coordination on the outpatient side too. So it's definitely a, a big role, at least in my hospital. So I think it's worth spending some time on, and I also think it's pretty interesting. <laughs> so all right, why are we suppressing the immune system? Well, we're going to talk about solid organ transplant, and um, you can also consider treatment of autoimmune disorders, which we'll talk about later uh, throughout the year. Uh, but um, the other way we can do it, uh, the other reason why cancer uh, can be treated by immune system suppression and also cell pro proliferation. So like um, stents placed in coronary arteries to open them up. Um, so if you've ever heard of the term drug eluding stent, that is uh, one that actually eludes drug and it's a um, uh, it's actually similar to some of the solid organ transplant anti-rejection meds we use. It prevents cell growth from like overtaking the stent. So anyway, I'm not going to talk about that other than that sentence and then we'll get on to transplant. So anyway, I want to stop the body from destroying the transplanted organ. So it depends on, you know, your treatment depends on if you're looking at host versus graft or graft versus host, what's trying to attack what. I'm not going to talk about bone marrow transplant at all today. It's a little bit different. Um, but anyway, we want to prevent acute rejection. So transplant is a lot of work. There's a lot of risk involved in transplanting an organ, especially a heart. And so we want to make sure that all of our ducks are in a row with drugs before um, we're good to go with the transplant and that the patient's going to be compliant with the medications too because if they don't take them, they can get rejection. And that's a lot of effort and a lot of um, patient care initiative and uh, obviously highly complicated, a big complication for the patient themselves. So anyway, uh, we're going to talk about renal transplant, but I'll mention cardi uh, cardiac transplant and some other stuff too here. Kidney transplant, obviously, being the most common transplant in the U.S. Uh, I scanned this out of a textbook, as you, <laughs> as you can see the, the blurry line here. Uh, I didn't like any of the pictures I could find online. Granted, I haven't tried to look recently. But I like this one because it has a little bit more. It's kind of like that drawing I showed you at the beginning, but I think it's a little more streamlined as far as what exactly works on the mechanism. And the stuff that's cut off isn't really all that important, too. Um, OKT3, we'll talk about that. That's more of like induction prior to transplant, unless you're doing that type of stuff, which, again, that gets really specialized in the transplant world. I'm not going to be super concerned you know what that is. The rest of these are important, though. So like cyclosporin, tacrolimus, mycophenolate, nocotyl, or MMF, or just mycophenolate, fine. And these are and serolimus, steroids, you can see your corticosteroids work there. So anyway, it's kind of got all your transplant stuff in a row and where it works on the CD4 T cell. Okay, so um, transplant medicine and anti-rejection medicine isn't that complicated, especially chronically. You're really just mixing three different mechanisms of action and you don't have a lot of options within those mechanisms. Within those mechanisms. So you're looking at an anti-metabolite, which is either going to be azathioprine or mycophenolate. You're looking at a calcineurin inhibitor, which is either going to be cyclosporin or tacrolimus, and then a glucocorticoid, which is almost always going to be prednisone. So you've got one of them already. We just talked about these, and now it's the rest of them we need to talk about. Now, what's all this junk I've got over here? Um, don't get too concerned. We're going to talk about some of this in context of when you would use it. So mTOR inhibitors are a replacement, and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. They are chronic medication, and they really are the fourth class. Right now, we don't consider them as a first line, but that could change in the future depending on new evidence. But right now, uh, this cornerstone th triple therapy, one of each uh, bullet, bold point, is still currently the, the preferred option. The other ones, the IL-2 receptors and the other agents, that's usually used either for one of two things, induction, which is to suppress the immune system 
drastically prior to transplantation. Now that's controversial. We'll talk about where you might use that. It's much more common in cardiac transplantation. Some kidney transplant centers don't even induce beforehand. They don't suppress the immune system. Well, they might give some steroids, but they probably aren't going to use one of these big guns. These are all MABs or something like a MAB, and they're all biologic products. They're all super expensive, and um, they all have pretty profound effects. So, And a lot of them have got their use other places. So they might be used for autoimmune diseases or chemotherapy or things like that. So like, yep. Um, like alemtuzumab, for example, got a big, uh, uh, well, I won't go into detail on that. It's not what we're talking about. <laughs> I don't want to confuse you guys. So anyway, the point is, is that these are situationally used. The other ones are much more common for the ongoing management of transplantation. That's really what I want to talk about today. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of transplantation and um, stuff like that. I will talk about it, but I'm not going to test or focus on it. I want you to be able to recognize those drugs and what they are. But as far as like putting them into a treatment algorithm, I'm less concerned about that. So anyway, um, let's talk about our anti-metabolites first. These inhibit synthesis of DNA, very similar to the concept of an anti-metabolite when we talked about chemotherapy, if you watched that lecture. Um, may interfere with cellular metabolism and inhibit mitosis. So that's going to focus on the, uh, the cellular uh, replication part of your CD4 uh, T cells. And two drugs here, azathioprine and mycophenolate. Azathioprine is our historical gold standard. Um, we don't use it a lot anymore because it's got more complications and side effects associated with it than mycophenolate. So cell scepter mycophenolate is the current drug of choice when it comes to anti-metabolites. So any patient getting transplanted today will probably be on cell sept unless something happened where they trialed it beforehand and it had a reaction to it or something like that. Generally speaking, cell sept is a drug of choice. You might still, still see people on azothioprine. Likely will be people who transplanted a long time ago, so maybe not that long ago, maybe like decades ago, 10, 20 years ago, might be on azothioprine, although mycophenolate's been around for probably 10, 15 years by itself. Um, but anyway, mycophenolate, more specific targeting, less side effects, and it also comes as an IV formulation, which is handy if you have somebody who comes in who's like, maybe you have a transplant patient who's really nauseous, they got gastroenteritis or something, they can't keep any of their pills down, so their mycophenolate level's plummeting and you're worried about anti their anti-rejection regimen getting compromised, and what you can do is give an IV dose of their cell stuff, you bypass the GI tract. It's a really nice advantage in situations like that. Azothioprine doesn't have anything like that. So it's another good thing about cell stuff. Both are very effective. One is not more effective than the other. And they have similar side effects. The big ones are going to be GI related. And of course, just think about azathioprine is amplified more so than cell stuff or mycophenolate. Mycophenolate is going to be better tolerated overall. Um, so azathioprine, if you take it with food, it can limit the GI effects. Um, some things like aluminum magnesium containing products, which would be like Rolaids or some, a lot of over-the-counter antacids have aluminum and magnesium salts in them. Those can bind up mycophenolates, so we don't want that to happen in our transplant patients. But anyway, just a side note there. Um, hematologic effects are the other big side effects. So leukopenia, anemias, and thrombocytopenia. So those happen pretty similarly with the bone. <clears throat> Neither one really causes enough hematologic effects to be problematic. Generally speaking, it's going to be these GI side effects that really cause intolerability with patients. So if they can't keep it down, that's a big deal. So sometimes some patients might actually take mycophenolate and have severe GI upset with it, and they might tolerate azathioprine just fine. It's rare, but you could see that be a potential um, situation. So again, we still have azathioprine as an option, but mycophenolate is much more common. It's generally preferred. Okay, calcineurin inhibitors, number two. Um, prevent upregulation of IL-2, which inhibits activation of our resting T lymphocytes. So cyclosporin and tacrolimus are the two drugs here. Um, cyclosporin and TAC both contain or both have very similar side effects as well. I've got some differences here, but um, they do share some of the more potent um, problematic side effects. But anyway, cyclosporin has a couple of different brand names and it's been reformulated over the years. So if you ever work with transplant patients, just double check what they're, if you're messing, or not messing, adjusting, that's a nicer word to say. If you're adjusting their cyclosporin dose or re-prescribing it or anything like that, just make sure you're writing the right brand name because they do make a difference. There are a lot of generic equivalents for these, but for example, Sandimmune, dose per dose, is not equivalent to GenGraph or Neural. GenGraph and Neural are relatively similar and can be almost one-to-one, -one, um, but there are differences in how the, um, the product is formulated. 
And this is one of the major areas of debate amongst um, medicine when it comes to generics and brands. People get a little nervous. So remember we talked about generics have to be, what, 85 to 105% pure as far as what they say on their label. Well, what if, let's say, the brand name product is 90%, um, so you give them somebody cyclosporin, neoral brand name, 100 milligrams a day, and they're really getting 90 because that's what's actually in there. I don't know. I'm just making up numbers. So you switch them to generic product, or you switch them to GenGraph, because that's what their insurance wants them to pay for. GenGraph is 100 milligrams of the same product. That's 10 milligrams difference. It could be enough to see more adverse effects. Or if you flip it, 10 milligrams could be enough to see a rejection over time. So it is something that we're really careful with. Um, these medications are monitored meticulously, and there's a lot of blood concentrations we look at. We look at um, overall uh, very subtle hints of rejection, hopefully to catch something like that before it actually happens. But it is an issue where you might see people who have been on these drugs for a long time still on the brand name product because that's just what they're on, and no one really feels comfortable switching. And it's reasonable in this population. It's very rare um, to have that concept at all. Most people don't care about switching in between. This is one of the areas of medicine where there's still some hesitancy in that, and I think it is somewhat justified. Um, the biggest one we've seen lately is cell stuff. So cell stuff went generic a few years ago. And so that's one that you'll still see people on the brand name of Celsip quite often because, and this brand name Celsip is still produced regularly because they still have a big market share. People don't want to switch off of it because they're nervous. And again, when it comes to rejection, that's a huge, if you think about the cost difference between a rejected organ versus a little bit more per month of your med bill, it, it's not even comparable, right? So we're, we're careful with that for good reason. Um, Tacrolimus is ProGraph, and actually there's some newer brand names of Tacrolimus out there now. Tacrolimus is a BID product, ProGraph is, and a couple of companies, it went off patent a while ago, so it's generic now, and a couple of companies got smart and reformulated it into one's daily formulation. So you might see some of those too. I don't, one's like called Astrograph, which is by the same company that makes ProGraph, and the other one's something else they can't remember. If they're new, they're super important that you know them, but just know that it does come in a once daily and twice daily formulation. Um, it is, has an IV form as well, which again is helpful for the reasons I talked about earlier. Cyclosporin does not, well, I shouldn't say that. I think cyclosporin does come IV. I think it does too. We'll just say it does. So they both come IV, so that's good. Uh, they're both heavily CYP3 a four metabolized. So this is a big deal. Again, if you think that subtle differences between brand and generic matter clinically for um, transplant, uh, drug interactions matter tremendously. So we really want to take note of any new medications we're adding or changing when it comes to transplant patients because even subtle, even something that's a mild inhibitor of CYP3A4 could really cause significant side effects or inducers especially, increasing metabolism could cause um, possibility for rejection because you're clearing the drug so fast. So with that in mind, just think about that. Like if I give you a test question that talks about a, a metabolic issues and drug interactions, uh, that's probably going to come up. Um, so I don't really care that you know how to dose it or change it, but just to be aware of it and that it's an issue is the most important thing. All right, um, adverse effects, so shared nephrotoxicity, which is, you might be thinking, why aren't these used for kidney transplant? Yes, so that's a big deal, of course. So if you're destroying the organ, you just transplant it, why would we want to do that? And it's not common, but it does happen. And it doesn't happen between the same drugs. So somebody might get that, somebody might see, or you might see a serum creatinine spike with somebody with cyclosporin, but tacrolimus doesn't cause the same effect. So there, that is the option. But sometimes they do both cause the same problem in the patient, and that's where we'll go to another class of drugs here. I'll talk about in a second. Tremors, hypertension, hyperglycemia, usually not significant enough for us to care that much. We manage it the way we would manage anything. So we manage the blood pressure, manage the, uh, the diabetes if they happen to get that, or their elevated blood glucose that way. Um, cyclosporin only can cause some increases in lipids. It can cause gingival hyperplasia, which is gums growing over the teeth. Uh, some hair uh, growth issues, hirsutism. Tacrolimus can cause some GI-related side effects, hepatotoxicity. I want you to memorize all these. I think the best thing to know is that they're nephrotoxic. That's the biggest side effect to take away from these. The rest of the stuff is manageable for the most part, or relatively uncommon. All right, glucocorticoids. So we just talked about prednisone, uh, usually dosed once daily. You usually start at a pretty high dose of prednisone, like, I don't know, 40, 60 milligrams, and they end up being pretty low. You end up being like 5 or 10 milligrams a day of prednisone. We talked about all the adverse effects already. Um, you might see IV methylprednisolone used prior to transplantation for induction, like a lot of 
IV, like a thousand milligrams is pretty common, so big dose of methylprep. All right, mTOR inhibitors. These are the alternate class we can use, and mostly they're used to replace calcineurin inhibitors to reduce risk of renal toxicity. So if you're tacrolimus, cyclosporin, you've been going back and forth between the two, you're still seeing elevated serum creatinine, probably time to try your mTOR inhibitors. Um, the mTOR inhibitors inhibit T lymphocyte activation and proliferation. And serolimus and verolimus, or affinitor, are the two drugs on the market right now. Um, the nice thing about these, you can also replace an anti-metabolite with them. So if we go back to our little scanned-in drawing here, you can see that they they interact on a separate axis, more or less, right? So you have steroids here, you have calcineurin inhibitors here, you have your anti-metabolites here, and then you have your mTOR. And at the time this was printed, uh, agarolimus didn't exist. So um, when we're talking about switching them, you can actually use it for both. More commonly, these are going to be used to replace the calcineurin inhibitor because the risk of kidney uh, toxicity is, is big, especially if that's what you've transplanted. Even if it's not, even if you're a cardiac transplant patient, it's still a big deal if you're getting losing your kidneys because then you're going right back into a situation that could put fluid retention and cause a heart failure exacerbation and, and ruin your whole transplantation process. So you can replace either one. Um, if somebody had really severe GI issues on their uh, anti-metabolite, that could be, of course, a replacement option. So use your imagination, but this could be uh, either way here, which is a nice option to have a third class to help people out who aren't tolerating one of the other ones. Um, adverse effects, hyperlipidemia, thrombocytopenia, lipopenia, peripheral edema, nothing too substantial, stuff we can work around for the most part. Say if somebody's super thrombocytopenic, that's a problem, but you usually don't see that happen to the extent of being clinically significant. Okay, uh, let's talk about a couple of these other odd drugs quickly. Um, IL-2 receptor blockers, these prevent activation and proliferation of T-cells, used for induction only. So these are only for induction, and if you're going to use induction, they're super expensive. They show it, uh, so it depends on what you're doing for induction, like but most Studies looking at induction for um, prior to like cardiac transplant, for example, show that you significantly reduce rejection. Um, studies looking at kidney transplantation might show that it's, uh, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Um, it's not to work on active T cells only. Uh, there's not a lot of side effects associated with these at all. They're big molecules that really only target specific things on a T cell. So other than decreasing your immune the immune system's ability to respond, which is the goal, that's all they really do. Uh, hypersensitivity. I think I mentioned this briefly when I talked about biologic products. Biologic products in general, much better tolerated and have very few side effects because they're so target specific. However, uh, hypersensitivity is going to be the big one. People just tend to react to them much more so than they would an oral medication. Not to say everyone's getting uh, reactions, but we do watch people a little bit care more carefully when they're getting a new monoclonal antibody than we would if they're getting like a new oral med. All right, uh, other transplant agents, some other things we can use for induction or acute rejection, rituxan, uh, alemtuzumab or CAMPAP, um, got its use in lymphocytic leukemia, but it, it basically obliterates your entire immune system. It's a really potent agent. Um, there's a couple other things here. Rabbit antithymocyte globulin interacts with T-cell antigens. It depletes T4 lymphocytes. OKT3, which you can't see on, this, on the page because it's blurry, uh, that has some effects as well. And again, a lot of this stuff kind of does the same thing. It's just very potent immune suppressive agents, and the use of some of these um, drugs is a little bit controversial. So let's talk about everything and see if we can put it all together. All right, so induction therapy, like I said, it's sometimes controversial, and it's going to depend a lot on what transplant center you work at. So if you go into transplant medicine, it's likely going to be protocol driven, depending on where you are and what institution you work at. And they might do induction for every patient. They might just do induction for parts. They might not do induction for kidneys. Um, I believe we induce for both. I can't remember. I know we induce for hearts for sure, but kidneys I'm not um, Anyway, so induction agents that are mostly um, studied right now are these four agents. Um, usually steroids are done at induction for all the cases, depending on what's going on, but generally speaking, they're going to be combined with this drug. So you're doing those two things, one of that group in the second box there, and then your IV methylprednisolone, and then you're ready for your transplantation. So that's keeping your immune system suppressed. It's going to have some sustained suppressive effects through the duration of the surgery, and hopefully 
a long time after the surgery, giving your body a chance to get the blood concentration of your um, new oral regimen up and running. So that's the idea here. All right, your maintenance therapy. So start your maintenance regimen, um, which is going to be one of each of your three, right? So your calcineurin inhibitor, your anti-metabolite, and your prednisone. Monitor the patient at determined intervals. Um, if rejection is occurring, you treat the rejection episode based on what type of organ is rejected. So let's talk about that briefly here. Uh, for kidneys and livers, you're looking at labs. So looking at for kidneys, serum creatinine, livers, transaminases. And then adjust maintenance regimen empirically depending on what's going on. So usually if you see the, that creatinine start to bump up, or those transaminases start to bump up, you're going to probably increase your dose. You can check your blood concentration of your drugs, and I didn't talk about that specifically, but we can do serum concentrations of tacrolimus, mycophenolate, et cetera, make sure that everything looks good, at least we're targeting the right serum concentration. It's not necessarily an end-all, be-all. It's not like we have to be within this range or this range, but it might give us a good clue on how high we can go. So maybe it's like, oh, we could almost double this person's dose and still be within a normal range based on what's studied without causing too many side effects. But generally speaking, labs show rejection, increase your dose empirically. Um, if the labs don't resolve, then you move to the heart algorithm, which starts a little bit more advanced. So um, for a heart transplant, if you suspect rejection or you're failing kidney liver impaired therapy and your labs are still going up, you've messed with the regimen, nothing's really happened, maybe you've given some IV doses of stuff, then you do a biopsy. So you want to confirm with the tissue that there is some rejection going on. Um, now, how they classify rejection is something I don't know and I'm not going to talk about. But they can classify it differently. So there's mild, moderate, or there's mild and severe. So if they classify it with mild, you want to treat it pretty aggressively with steroids, usually methylprednisolone or dexamethasone. Uh, after that, if rejection is still present, you're going to move to the moderate category. And then you're adding on something more advanced. So usually you're going to give them an IV, anti-metabolite, steroids, and then you could consider thiamocyclobulin too. And don't think too hard about this because I'm not going to test you on a lot of this stuff. I just want you to know how all this stuff fits in and where people go when they have rejection and what we do for them. So a lot of times we're just doing more aggressive therapies of what's already got, what we've already got going on when it comes to their uh, maintenance regimen. Um, ultimately, if rejection is still occurring and they keep failing it, we're going to go to one of the big guns over here. So these are the sort of end-all, be-all, and those should really wipe out the immune system, allow you to start fresh. Again, not a lot of side effects with those other than the fact that your immune system is wiped out. So you might have to stay in the hospital for a few days, make sure you aren't getting exposed to pathogens or anything like that. Opportunistic infections would be a huge complication risk for these patients undergoing um, rejection. So that's why... We want to avoid this if possible. Now, sometimes you can't. You have the issue that comes up where people will reject regardless of how well you treat them. It's possible. Um, but if they take their medications right and they're being monitored correctly, it's very rare uh, to see this actually go to this stage. So, All right. Um, that's why this bullet point in the top is a big deal. Compliance is huge with these patients. You cannot transplant a non-compliant patient. You just can't do it. Somebody who's not in here with medications prior to transplant isn't going to have a come-to-Jesus moment and suddenly do it. That we just don't trust them enough to invest all the resources, give that organ to somebody when somebody else who is in here with medications might be right behind them and deserve it just as much as them. So we have to take that and act a little bit judiciously with the resources we have. We had kidneys and hearts forever, but if we can grow them in a lab, great, maybe we'll be there someday. We aren't right now. Although we do do artificial ones now, so there's that. But even with that in mind, you still it's still a complicated medical procedure, right? You still have to be really compliant. I mean, yeah, maybe you can do a lot of education, or maybe they have home health care assistance or something like that you could think about. It. But at the end of the day, adherence is key. If you aren't adherent, you're going to probably get rejection. Medications also aren't cheap. Fortunately, a lot of stuff is generic now, and costs have come down substantially. But um, some of the IV stuff, like the anti-reject, like the induction stuff, that's still really expensive. A lot of the oral maintenance regimen drugs are relatively affordable now, which is nice. Um, consistent timing of doses is required. So not only do you have to be good about remembering to take your medications every day, you usually have to time it out. Like when I see transplant patients come into the hospital, they always have like a chart. They have all their doses. They they put X's when they have them. They know everything. They're the best patients to do an admission. Uh, med history on because they know all their stuff. And there's a reason for it because if they don't know their stuff, they could die. Um, so it's it's very important, obviously. Um, additional drugs to prevent adverse drug reactions. So a lot of times you see these patients, not only do some of the drugs have side effects that might need to be treated, but you also have the whole immunocompromised state going on. 
ones. So prophylaxis, mouth ulcerations, brush, skin infections. Um, like if somebody's got skin folds, they're more at risk for like uh, yeast infections. So like topical antifungals can be helpful. Malignancies such as skin cancer and osteoporosis are also seen commonly with these. Frequent monitoring is required, um, and most institutions, again, have detailed protocols on how to handle all this, but uh, this is important too. Patients usually need to be pretty close to a transplant center to be able to get in regularly for their visits. So it's like, if you live in the middle of nowhere, you might need to consider moving if you're going to be a transplant patient. All right, questions? That's it. So next week, we've got a few more. We'll, we'll do a couple of more focused lectures on uh, eye-related conditions. And we'll do uh, some more general stuff talking about antihistamines and some ENT-related things and some potpourri stuff that, I don't know, this, this module is a little bit helter-skelter. Cardiovascular is nice and focused. So <laughs> if you don't like the disorganization here, it's really just because a lot of this is how the course was set up, and it's just content we need to get in. And a lot of it doesn't fit in a specific disease necessarily, but it's really broad in its application. So we talk about the drugs now, and we'll fill ourselves in how they work in diseases later. But once we get to cards, it's much more focused. We talk about individual diseases and drugs, and then we kind of roll that way from there. So bear with me. We'll get through it.